Welcome to the Leaders Agenda, a series dedicated to reimagining leadership within life sciences. My name is Tarja Huskonen, and I'm your host. The Leaders Agenda invites insights and perspectives from some of the very best leaders of our time, wisdom that you too can build into your own Leaders Agenda. Hello, Eduardo Prisenio. It is so nice to have you on Leaders Agenda. It's great to be here, Tarja. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I want to have a great conversation with you, but before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to our viewers. And I do have a, a little uh, bio of yours here. So let me read that, and then maybe you can also uh, elaborate on that a little bit more. But Eduardo is, is a quite an interesting guest uh, for many, many reasons. He's a global keynote speaker, facilitator, and author who has guided many world's leading companies in developing cultures of learning and high performance. He's, has, he's also a TEDx speaker and his TED and TEDx talks have been viewed more than 9 million times globally. That's quite the number right there, Eduardo. He is the author of The Performance Paradox, which I just happen to have right here. It is a book that just came out a few weeks ago, not that long ago, and I have had the chance to read it and I'm absolutely thrilled to have this conversation with him about it. Um, after publishing this book, he has also been selected as a must-read author by the Next Big Idea Club. So the book has already been noticed by many out there and he has been shortlisted by Thinkers 50, which uh, is kind of the equivalent of Oscars of management thinking. Congratulations for that, Eduardo. And that's a, a breakthrough idea award, I think, coming out um, from, uh, that is usually given for thinkers who have ignited eureka moments in management, offering radical ideas that have the potential to reshape the future of business as we know it. Congratulations, Eduardo, of what an amazing uh, achievement, and thank you for this book uh, that we will talk about. Thank you, Tarja, for reading it and for having me on the show. I look forward to the conversation. Okay, so uh, just to get started, so I did read the book, and as you can see, I have noted all kinds of things, which we'll be talking about as we go there, but um, one, of the, one of the key themes that really struck with me was um, we all have the ability to fall into what you call a chronic performance mode. And in fact, we probably all do that without even noticing that that's where we are. Because we do it with good intentions. We want to work hard so that we can affect those that we really care for, whether that's at work or in our personal lives. So we try harder, we work harder, and we think that by that we can have a better impact. But actually, sometimes just the opposite might happen. What do you say about that? Yeah, I that was a big realization for me that I realized and now I've realized a lot of people are in the same situation where we have this sense that the way to improve and to succeed and to make an impact is just to work hard and to do the best we can, trying to minimize mistakes all the time. And I've realized that that is misguided because there's two different forms of effort that I wasn't clear on. There's effort to improve, which I call the learning zone, and effort to perform, which I call the performance zone. And often we get trapped in just performing, executing, getting things done. And that's really important that, you know, the performance zone is how we get things done, is how we make an impact. If we are operating as a surgeon on somebody, we want to perform. We want to put our best foot forward and minimize mistakes in that moment. But if that's all we're doing all the time, then we're not getting better, right? We're not um, going out and learning from new research, new techniques, new new technologies. If we are a cardiologist uh, and we're not engaging the learning zone to continue to improve our diagnosis of heart sounds, we might forget like the, the different how different sounds of different diagnoses sound, and we might not notice it. We're just continuing to diagnose 
and our our effectiveness might decrease over time and we might not even notice it because we're just trying our best all the time uh, and not incorporating kind of learning zone habits as part of uh, how we operate. And so this learning zone is important for all of us to understand at a very personal level, I think, um, as a result of it. And you're tying learning zones specifically with growth mindset. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I started on this journey that I'm on uh, when I met Stanford professor Carol Dweck when I was in grad school in 2007. Uh, and I co-founded with her an organization called Mindset Works. And her work, she discovered uh, what she called a growth mindset which is the belief that people can change, the belief that our qualities and our abilities are malleable and things that we can develop over time, as opposed to a fixed mindset, which is when we see our qualities or abilities as fixed. So for example, a lot of us might see intelligence as something that is fixed in people. You might either have it at a high level or medium or low, and it doesn't change. That would be a fixed mindset about intelligence. Or we might think that because somebody's a great leader, we might think of them as a natural leader, right? And something that they're a great leader because there's something fixed in them rather than everybody can continue to become a better leader, right? Or become smarter, which is, which, which, which is a growth mindset. And we all are a mix of growth mindset and fixed mindset about different things. And this is not binary, right? We can be somewhere in the middle and we shift our mindset over time depending on the situations that we're in. But the more we can realize where our fixed mindsets might be creating problematic behaviors that are preventing us from taking risks or from listening to feedback or from experimenting um, so that we can improve, then the more we can realize that we are creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we're labeling somebody and think of them as unable to change, we might not share information with them mm. that is important for them to realize that there's an opportunity. And so a fixed mindset creates a self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, a growth mindset, is necessary for us to become motivated and effective learners, but it's not sufficient. In addition to believing that we can change, we also need to know how to change. And the foundation of that is a distinction between the performance zone and the learning zone. But there's also lots of other learning zone strategies that we can learn in terms of to, to understand how the strategies to improve are different from the strategies to perform. And, and getting on that journey of getting better at getting better is you know helps us have a greater impact over time whether it is on our patients or our families or ourselves mm -hmm. and so so what you really are saying is we have to operate in both zones for the for the best impact in the world for ourselves for our happiness for uh, outcomes that we want at work or in our relationships we have to understand what the distinction is and also know that there's a time for each Absolutely. The performance zone and the learning zone are both critical. Okay. And the performance zone is, is how we get things done. So yes, we want to, um, whether it is in our lives as individuals or in our teams or organizations, we want to think about our habits and our systems to make both zones the easy default, the way that we live and the way that we work. And often our systems and our habits are only performance oriented. Like in our meetings, we might just be tracking what needs to be done by when and how are we going in our progress to get those things done. Um, and, and so we need to think about, that's great. We need, we need those performance zone systems, but what are the learning zone systems that are going to help us increase our competence and our performance over time? Okay, so let's go back to the uh, to the meetings in a second, uh, because I actually want to take a look at a typical meeting that is in performance zone and one that also brings in the learning zone. And let's think about what that difference is. But before we go there, you very, you know, this idea of a growth mindset, I think is, is quite widely now talked about in the corporate world as well. And of course, uh, I work very closely in the, in the life sciences world with many large corporations. Um, and so everybody kind of talks about growth mindset. What was very striking in book, in your book, was that it really isn't enough just to have the mindset. And you just said it a, a, a few minutes ago. We need to have the right strategies and habits for growth. Um, and uh, that is actually kind of the work inside the learning zone. So can you talk a little more about what do we mean by coming up with the right strategies and habits for growth? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, 
you know, a, a way to get really clear about this is to step out of our context and look at people who are fantastically skilled and it's, they're just objectively world-class. So for example, you know, a world-class athlete, right? Uh, you might think that somebody becomes a world-class tennis player because they've spent 10,000 hours playing tennis. Yeah. But that's not how people become fantastic tennis players. When they're playing a championship final, it's a high stakes situation. They're trying to minimize mistakes. They're going to be using the moves that really work for them and that lead them to avoid mistakes, right? And they're going to avoid the moves that they're having trouble with. Um, they're going to stay within what they know best and trying to minimize mistakes. But then after the game, they'll go to their coach and say, coach, I have to work on this move that I was trying to avoid when I was performing. That's what I need to work on now and pay attention to and, and spend all my time on. And that's a very different activity than what we do when we're performing. And and what that that's the part that we miss, right? It's like figuring out how what do I need to do differently than the activity in order to get better at those at those particular skills. Um, but so we need the strategies, and we also, to your point about growth mindset. We need to, at the same time, also work to change our belief about the nature of abilities, because if somebody isn't isn't engaging in the strategies, mm -hmm. we might just encourage them to engage in those strategies. But if, they, if they're in a fixed mindset, believing that they can't change, then they're going to avoid those strategies because they're going to make them feel bad, right? It's like, why would I work on this thing that I'm really bad at and that I'm failing at all the time? Uh, I just want to prove myself that I am good because I have the belief that people are either good or bad at things. Um, and so we need to work on both both of these levels and uh, helping ourselves and others shift our beliefs about the nature of our abilities and learn how to change those abilities over time. Yeah, and I, th I think you talk about the difference between proving and improving. Uh, so when we are in this performance zone, we are really about proving. We're proving ourselves. We need to be better than everybody else sometimes. We get very competitive, perhaps. We need to be flawless. We need to be perfecting our, you know, seen perfecting uh, uh, as, as perfect. That is not a finished word because I'm definitely not going to do very well with a perfection in Finnish and the English is not working out very well today. But we are perfecting our skills actually not in our performance zone. We are perfecting the skills in the learning zone, if I hear you right. And in that learning zone, what you also talked about it is you honing in, and that's what you just said actually a minute ago as well, is you honing in on almost like a sub skill. So I'm the great tennis player, and um, and I know already I've got this one. So I'm gonna I'm gonna fall back on what I know I can count on because I I've got it. But when I'm in the learning zone, I'm honing in the few things, and maybe it's even a sub skill or something little, um, and how I'm you know I don't know I don't play tennis, so I I guess like I'm not a good one to give a good example. Is that right? So we really have to be specific sometimes in that learning zone to get to a, kind of the next level of ability. Yes, being specific is very helpful. And specific, particularly in the types of situations that you're describing, like in sports or, you know, ballet or playing the violin, um, what the strategy that is most powerful to build our skills is called deliberate practice. And in deliberate practice, we first identify a very specific sub skill that we want to improve on. Like if, if it's tennis, it might be, I'm going to work on my drop shot when I'm, you know, running from this part of the court to this other part of the court. And I'm going to try to put that drop shot on that particular other side of the court. And so we try it once and then the ball might go a little bit too much to the right. And so we make adjustments in the next attempt and it might go too much to the left and and through feedback through each iteration we make adjustments uh in order to to continue improving that particular shot that particular situation ideally with the guidance of a coach or a teacher who can give us feedback uh, on our technique and on what to work on what's the you know for somebody at our level uh what is a good thing for us to work on next um so so that's deliberate practice and that involves you you might be doing that for like a half hour right just 
working on a particular not a, like when i used to play the guitar i would quote practice by just playing the songs that i liked i enjoyed playing those songs and singing and i thought that i was practicing to get better but i wasn't now i know uh you know in in playing an instrument you would again play like identify a specific sub skill like a particular technique with your fingers and then that is challenging for you that is at the next level of challenge and try that and see how it sounds and then try it again make adjustments to to get the sound that you want out of that little particular piece um, of 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 the song or of the of the technique that you're trying to do with your fingers um, and so that that is deliberate practice um, but the specificity of what we're working on is helpful also in lots of other scenarios like when we're soliciting feedback you know it's helpful to to ask specifically what what do we want feedback on what am I working on uh, to make it easier for the other person to to digest and to give you information that's most relevant to you as an example hmm. and so um, the other thing that's important about that learning zone and, and 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 practicing there is it's a really safe environment to make mistakes and we um, we, we learn from making mistakes and you're talking about okay I'm, I'm watching where what's happening as, as a result of something that I try and then I can tweak it again, right? So that also means that I could use potentially, depending on what it is that I'm working on, I might use video. If I don't have a coach who's watching and, and giving me feedback, I could also give self-feedback. Absolutely. Um, and uh, yes, we, we want to engage in, in trying new things that may or may not work. So engage in the learning zone when the consequence of mistakes is not going to be very great at all. It's yeah. a safe yeah. time, right? If we're in a championship final, you know, we, we've we worked really hard to try to win this game. We want to be in the performance zone, not in the learning zone. We, we don't want to be experimenting with things that may or may not work. We're going to, you know, we might have to be forced to do that in a situation where we don't have a choice. But we are, if we have the choice to go with the shot that's going to be like a safe winner, uh, we're gonna tr we're gonna choose that in that situation. Yeah. Uh, or if we're in front of a patient where a mistake is gonna create, it could create a significant health problem for the patient. We're gonna use the technique that we think works well, right? And so yes, we want to identify what are the times and spaces for me to be in the performance zone, and then what are the times and spaces where I can challenge myself and and engage in learning zone strategies. And then what are the times and spaces where I can do both at the same time, where I can get things done in a way that is also going to lead to new insights and strategies along the way. And for most of us, actually, we want to spend most of our time in that learning while doing zone, where we're getting things done, not only with the goal of getting things done, but with the goal of getting things done while improving along the way. Mm. And, and when we are combining these two zones and we are doing what you just described, um, is, there, is there a trick to doing that well? Well, first, being deliberate, like to your earlier point, yeah. is really important. Of, like, what am I working to improve or what are we as a team working to improve and how are we going about it? Uh, that's helpful because then you can identify what's my hypothesis of something that I can do differently to improve at that thing. Yeah. Um, because... One thing is sometimes we, we like the idea of improvement, but we don't like the idea of change very much. And we, the reality is that we can't improve without changing. If we're the same today than we were last month, we haven't gotten better. Yeah. In fact, we've probably gotten a bit less effective because the world has changed and we have not. And so the more that we understand that we can change, which is the growth mindset, the more that improvement is possible. Uh, so being deliberate, uh, trying new ways of doing things, not showing up every day in the same way, doing the same thing. There's yep. no way to improve that way. Um, so experimenting with new approaches and noticing the effect of those approaches, whether it is by us noticing or by soliciting feedback from the people around us or from the people we're trying to serve. Soliciting feedback is probably like the most right. effective strategy in the workplace. Absolutely. Because we right. are so then we're that, usually trying to have enough. Yeah. yeah so then ahead. that kind of takes me back to the meeting, right? Because you were describing yeah. a meeting that's in the performance show. So what is that? Yeah. We're going to basically have a progress report. We're going to look at dates. How are we doing? And I'm going now into a project meeting, okay? Because I, the, you know, I, I work in innovation. Um, in life sciences. So that's very project based. There's always a project goal to be met and there are lots of deadlines. So the performance zone is very much the mode that those meetings tend to be. Task oriented, time oriented, 
quick uh, recaps on where we have issues or problems, but that's about it. I, if I want to change that mode to something more balanced, what would I, what would I see in that agenda? Well, first, I think th all those things you describe are helpful. It's not like we want to remove those things. Uh, we want to s s keep in place um, structures to keep ourselves accountable and to support one another to get things done. Um, but also then incorporate kind of learning zone systems as well so that we can be accountable not only to getting things done, but also accountable to learning and improving along the way. And so, for example, at, at LinkedIn, they have a weekly meeting among the top 100 leaders there at LinkedIn. And when they started being more deliberate about improvement, they added an agenda section to that meeting where they invite anybody of those 100 people to share something that they learned the prior week and what anybody could do differently as, a, as an insight that it came out of what they learned. You know, how, how could we do things differently in the future um, based on this insight that we gained last week? That's, that is a very simple thing to do. You change the agenda yeah. and it changes the conversation, right? And so then people started sharing um, things that they learned the prior week, which is really helpful to their colleagues and sur surprising to them. Then other people who were beyond that group of 100 top leaders asked started asking whether they could attend the meeting just to listen in, you know, because they wanted to learn from what people were learning. Um, and just think about how much people tend to try to avoid meetings. And now you have people trying to ask to, yeah. to, 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 to attend meetings because they're valuable to them. Uh, so that, that's an example. We can, we can s create spaces for people to ask questions for each other or share something that they're struggling or grappling with to, to gather other people's ideas. Um, those are some examples of things that are learning zone conversations that we can talk about in meetings. Yeah, and I love I love I love these ideas, and I love the the also the specific example from LinkedIn. I'm going back into also project meetings. We often talk about the need to have high performing teams, um, and certainly innovation teams and and those product delivery teams are very much on that category. Companies want them to become high performing teams very quickly. It strikes me that, well, first of all, we might be defining high performing incorrectly if we're only thinking at it from the performance zone perspective. But the other thing is that it's going to be really important then for those kinds of teams to really have deliberate space for learning and reflection, I think, amongst themselves. And that reflection isn't just about what it is that we're doing from the product perspective that we're trying to build, although that can be incredibly valuable. But it seems to me also that what's also important is have learning on how we work with one another. How do we improve the way we as a team can break the silos, can collaborate better, and can in fact execute better because a lot of the measurement is in execution, but execution fails quite often. Absolutely, yeah. So we can think about um, in projects, kind of post-action reviews to think about what went well, what did we do well, and what could we do better? What might be yeah. some challenges that we had that we could shift for the next project? We could also do instead of, or in addition to post-action reviews, we could do mid-action reviews where sure. in, in the middle of a project, we're checking in just like you suggest and learning about how to make the product or service better. But also like what you're saying is how are we working together? You know, what is what are some observations that people have and what are some ideas for what we could try differently? Maybe our meetings are too long and there might be uh, ways that we can think about making them shorter or having fewer people be in the meeting and, and get the information or having more people be in the meeting and be more informed, but talking about um, how are we collaborating and what, uh, how is what we're doing landing with each other and how, what are ideas for how we can continue to work differently so that we can work better. Yeah. Um, I want to actually talk about a little bit more about the, the company side of things. But before that, I have to take this to a personal level because there's something really delightful in your book that just resonated at a super personal level for me. Because somewhere there, you specifically said 
anyone. And this is available for anyone. Anyone can actually check their beliefs, first of all, around growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And then really think about what's important for them. And you talk about purpose quite a bit. You talk about identity uh, quite a bit. And uh, for me on a personal level, I went through a, a, a very significant experience in my life some years ago um, where I lost a lot of my abilities the way I knew them to be. I had a, an overnight brain aneurysm rupture and ended up uh, almost dying, but also as a result of it, even though I look and uh, sound even pretty normal these days, I still suffer uh, of many what might be considered defects that would keep me from doing things. And um, I was definitely in that mindset for a while where, you know, I had always been a dancer, for instance, and suddenly I couldn't take instruction anymore. And I thought, okay, I can still dance, I can move, perhaps, which I, but what about actually dancing? And um, since then, I now dance Argentine tango uh, quite, you know, quite often. In fact, I have a, a routine, but it w I was reminded of, what, of sort of what my instructor said to me when I first started working with him. And he works, I call him my therapist. He's my tango instructor. But he and I, we work on a weekly basis together. And it has been the best therapy ever. My balance has improved. My, my movement has improved. Um, but most importantly, my sense of self, I've retained that in a very different way. And I don't feel that I, I have lost the ability to learn those things that I just can't learn them the same way. And he said to me, he said, you know, it's all in your head. It's all in your head. You, let's just figure out what we can do differently. And I learned to learn differently as a result of it. So your book and the messaging in the book for me became extremely personal. And, and I think this is important for a lot of people to hear because we carry these packages along with us, whether those come from you know, things that have happened to us or, or the tapes that have played in our lives. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Tadia. And, um, and I know that, that you also support a lot of people with brain injuries in helping them go through those hard times and find, uh, get them to a great place where they're functioning and they are uh, bringing in like value to other people like you're doing. So thank you for that important work. Um, and it, it's, it's something that sometimes, like I've gone through, I, I had a significant health issue called a repetitive strain injury called myofascial pain syndrome, where I was, um, um, I was losing function of my hands. I, I couldn't, I met people with my same condition who couldn't use their hands for more than 10 minutes a day. And I didn't know if I was going to become unable to work because I didn't know how to do anything without my hands. Um, and it was really hard to diagnose. I went to a lot of people who didn't know what I had. Um, and then it was really hard to figure out like what was going on with my body and how to find an effective treatment. And also what were all the root causes that led to it? And what were all the changes that I need to make in my life um, in order to live differently? And um, so it's at, at, at some point in that journey, sometimes we can end up feeling helpless yeah. if we run out of ideas around strategies, right? So if you if you were learning in a particular way and now that's no longer working for you, we might say, I can't learn. Like we might get to that conclusion of, I can't learn because I'm trying and I'm, I'm not able to, to learn. Whereas like you said, okay, I need to try different strategies and, and seek, you know, different coaching from different people. And you have found ways that to realize that you you have found ways that to learn and to continue to become and to continue to develop yourself in the way you want to. Um, and that is very empowering and it can help us uh, then set goals and pursue those goals, right? And when, when we struggle, then try different strategies and ask for help from different people and persevere. Um, and so we, we, but we, but you need, um, a sense of purpose, which you, you talked about. We need 
to have a reason to care. And for you and for me, at some point, part of our reason was to heal and to and to get to a good place in our lives. Um, then for me, and, and I think for you too, but for me at that point, it also put my life in perspective in terms of, wow, I can't take my life for granted. I can't take my right. ability I can't take my hands for granted, so I can't take my ability to do things for granted. So I better do something worthwhile while, while I can do things, while yeah. I have my hands, I better do something that's going to uh, contribute to other people. And that gave me a sense of purpose. Um, but so, so in, you know, both the learning zone and the performance zone take effort and we need a reason to put in the effort. We need a yeah. reason to care. And so it, it is also something that sometimes just like we get trapped in, in chronic performance, sometimes we get trapped in pursuing goals that are not the most important. And if we ask ourselves, what is most important to me? And we write that down and we think about, am I regularly engaging in the learning zone with respect to that? If that's really what's most important yes. to me, how can I get better at it? Um, then we can really connect with what matters most to us and how do we use both the learning zone and the performance zone in order to continue to improve in that dimension. Yeah, and thank you for sharing your story as well. These are, you know, these are those moments in our lives that are the big aha moments. But the the moments can also be in inside each day and each relationship if we are alert to those. Um, one habit that I noticed um, in the book you were describing, you have, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I, I you said that every morning you wake up. And you have a few triggers that remind you. What are those triggers that you use every morning? Yeah, well, my fir my morning habit, the first thing I do every day is, is my most important habit. Um, I think it's a really treasured space that I'm glad like I've come to deliberately design um, because it really sets me up for the day and, and life is made out of days, right? So my experience of life is significantly influenced by my morning habit. And the first thing that I do when I wake up and I, I decide to get out of bed is I just kind of get on my back and I express gratitude for the things that are most important to me, which are, you know, life, health, love, and peace. And so I, I notice what, what those four things I see as glasses partly full and partly empty. Like there's life, but there's also death. There's love, but there's also hate, right? And, and war. Um, there's health, but there's also disease and pain. Uh, and if I didn't pay attention to the parts of those glasses that are full, that are there in my life and in the world, then I would be paying too much attention to the negative and not noticing the positive because our brain tends to go to the threats, right? In order to protect us, that's just how our brain works. And because kind of social media and the news accent accentuates those negative things yeah. because they draw attention, so they draw clicks. And so being intentional for me about starting with first, what are the most important things to me so that that puts everything else in perspective, right? When I have trouble, when I, when I, when there's things that don't go my way, I can say like, okay, in, in terms of life, health, love, and peace, like those are the most important things. It helps me kind of stay calm and, um, and, and be grateful for just being living and having this opportunity to live every day. Um, uh, and then also kind of notice what's there. So, so that's part of my morning routine. That's the first thing I do. Then I do other things like, you know, make my, smoothies which are important to me and meditate um but another thing that i do every morning is just rem when i'm getting closer to like starting my work day um i start by reminding me myself of a few things like what what are my missions what are my strategic goals and what do, what are most important goals for the day but also what am i working to improve and how am i going about it so that every day I ensure that I am reminding myself of what, what is it that I'm proactively trying to improve. And that primes a growth mindset, it primes a learning zone, and it helps me kind of pay attention to opportunities to improve, you know, throughout yeah. each day. And these reminders can be very simple. They can be something on the wall that, that stare that you look at for a few moments before you jump into your first meeting of the day. Um, and I, I'm, thank you for sharing that. And, and I'm asking this, examples partly because I think we also get so busy in our lives and going back then to that chronic performance mode 
um, you know, we, we jump out of the bed, we get into the first meeting, and then it's meeting after meeting after meeting. Um, and it often goes until the late night. So that at that point, we really exhausted and we're just going to fall asleep and we start again the next day. So it's really easy for life to go by. And like you said, we only have this life. And it, you know, I know you said it's in days. I count mine in moments. And I think this is an important message on an individual level. Um, on the company level, these two things are kind of intertwined a little bit here because um, you also say that it's possible for anyone to ignite chains within inside a company. And pretty much by focusing on the things that they can most affect um, as the starting point. But I also, you know, I like this, I like this um, conversation about uh, LinkedIn and your example, because by starting a change, a relatively easy change to implement, it also built more participation, more collaboration, more interest. So sometimes starting small is actually a great thing because it becomes more contagious. It, it catches the eye of other people. Uh, do we change companies with the small fires or do we change companies with a big initiative? It can start in different ways. Uh, to build on your LinkedIn example, you know, a, a structure like, like a, a section agenda in a weekly meeting, uh, like you said, can be a great opportunity to, to, to message what's important and for leaders to model learning. And so, you know, when they are presenting that change to the meeting and at, when they're going into that meeting section, um, they, they say, you know, this is, they, they, they explain and they remind to people, you know, we want to always continue to improve. So here's where we get smarter. And then the, the, the most senior leaders make it a point to regularly share something that they learned, you know, maybe like a mistake that they made and, uh, maybe a risk that they took, um, and a question that they asked that led to lots of insight so that people are seeing that. Uh, engaging in these behaviors is safe, like this is something that everybody does, including senior leaders, but even more than safe is encouraged, right? It's what we're, what we're encouraging each other to do um, because this is what's how we learn, this is how we improve, this is how we increase our performance. Um, and so it can start from a small, you know, change like that. Uh, and it can be, that can become like um, a key strategy or habit that can remind everybody and it primes everybody to then be in the learning zone outside of the meeting, right? To like, to be modeling this with the people that they lead or to be even doing that when they go home. And so through building this habit, um, neurons fire together, you know, thinking yeah. about learning and they wire together, the more they fire together and, and they, people start thinking differently. Uh, so that's one way to start. Uh, sometimes it's more, like you say, kind of big, you know, sometimes the most senior executives are, um, going through a, a time of transformation. They might want to do a refresh of their core values and their guiding behaviors. And they might kind of have meetings around what do we want our culture to be the next version of our culture in our company. And they might, um, identify a few things that they care most about and learning or growth mindset can be one of those things. And then they can, um, they can decide, uh, how they want to, uh, what kinds of systems, right. And structures they want to put in the organization in order to do this, they can, there can be efforts around educating people and, and giving them tools to use on a regular basis. So it can be a big effort. And that's, that was the case, like at Microsoft, for example, which, you know, had over a hundred thousand people at the time. Now it's much bigger. Um, and, uh, and it started, it started at the top, but no matter where anybody is, like you said, we can start with what we can most influence. You know, we certainly can influence ourselves to change ourselves, but we can also, you know, at the very least be great influences on our team. And I think that the team, the people that we work closest with is really the strongest cultural unit. You know, we build our own norms and kind of, uh, habits of how we collaborate and understanding of each other. And we can get into a conversation of, Hey, like, here's, 
this framework, for example, of you know performance zone and learning zone, how are we doing? I mean, you know, do we want more learning zone? Are we doing well with it? Can we improve? What do we work on? And that can be a conversation that can that can start a a, a channel of communication and a habit around working together uh, around the culture that you want to build. Yeah. So can we talk a little bit about innovation in context of all of this? So. Um, in product innovation, specifically on in the medical side, um, what most of the larger companies do is they actually kind of separate perhaps the early part of the innovation. That's when we really are inventing uh, as idea generation, and oftentimes that's a special team, and that's sort of they have a very different mode of operation. At some point, though, these ideas are are considered to be ready to move into what we would call the product development process, which starts usually in, in really nailing down the concept, the product concept, and then starting to um, do a, a series of testing, some kind of feasibility testing to see, you know, is it really possible in our capabilities? This is the front end still of innovation in my, in my uh, opinion. This is where we don't yet know how we're going to do it. We don't know yet what's the best way. We have many possibilities. And to me, that's very much a learning zone element because we may call it feasibility testing when we're working on a medical device. But in fact, what is that all about? It's having a lot of hypotheses. And some of it works, some of it doesn't work. Um, oftentimes we fail many times. However, and here's my dilemma, because of the metrics that we under in corporate structures, all the way driven by Wall Street, by the time that we're in this official process, we have a milestone to meet and another milestone to meet and another milestone to meet, and we have to commit. How can we deal with this pressure that isn't, you know, so it's not inside of my team. The pressure is coming from everywhere and everyone feels it and yet we know we have to slow down before we can go fast yeah uh, so first I, I think process is helpful right so if you have an early stage discovery process there can be lots of benefits to going through that process and it might have some kind of divergent thinking stages where you are uh, ideating and going for quantity, for example, yeah. rather than quality of ideas. And then there might be other stages where there's more convergent thinking, where you're slowing down and thinking an analytically and trying to make, come to conclusions. And going through processes like that uh, is really helpful uh, for us to get into the mental states and into the strategies that, that work for us. Um, and, but to your earlier point, sometimes we engage in these learning zone strategies very effectively on the product and then we miss the strategies on how are we working together and how do we give and receive feedback and how do we change you know, and improve the process, for example, or the way that we communicate or collaborate. Uh, so that's something to think about. Um, and then to your point about kind of the, the pressure to perform, yeah, that's the, that's the paradox is that if we are trying to, if our milestones are short term, like, you know, we have to do something and get it done this week. Like the way to get something done this week is through the performance zone, not the learning zone, right? And so when we have, um, when, we, when we are only focused on short term execution goals, then we tend to be pressured to be into a performance zone. And, and noticing that is helpful, right? And so noticing and thinking about, um, am I, are we in our system um, are we overly being pressured to be in the performance zone? And is that preventing us from performing higher, right? From discovering more and innovating more over the medium term and the long term. Um, and then if that's the case, then either kind of we can start conversations, you know, more broadly with the people who are in charge of our systems, or we can try to create buffers, right? And say, okay, like, you know, we're going to execute toward this milestone, but what are the times and spaces that the structures that we're going to create within our team in order to be more exploratory and tinker more with things and to even be kind of playful or whatever we want to do um, in order to invest more in more radical ideas that can be really more game changing right in mm -hmm. the longer term and really be able to increase our performance and our ability to impact um, but those are good kind of dynamics and challenges to think through um, in order to 
increase our performance. And that's the paradox. That if we're too focused on the performance goal, especially if it's a short-term performance goal, um, then it lowers our ability to perform. Yeah. So you mentioned Microsoft, and I know in your book you also talk about other companies, some who do the balance quite well, and also you have a few stories of organizations that didn't do it so well, but have learned, Microsoft being one of those. Um, what are some of the learning nuggets that we should take, other than what we've already discussed, from a, a, a really kind of corporate side of things to say, mm -hmm. if I want to really build a systemic way for a larger company, or for not so large company, but, it, but nevertheless across multiple functional silos which have their own subcultures are there takeaways that we should really think about as we plan the initiative and is it an initiative or is it something else well you know it can be a, a transformation initiative which um which is an effort to to transform our culture and the way we do things the way we view uh, our work um and it, it is like at Microsoft, they see it as a process that doesn't end. You know, it's not like it has a beginning and an end. They're still working on their culture, even though they've made so much progress. Um, but, but I think I would offer kind of three things to think about. One is framing or setting, like uh, one important way to frame is to set the stage, meaning um, how, what is the guiding language and what are the mental models that you want to be building? Um, like, for example, is part of what we do on a daily basis mm -hmm. work to change ourselves? Is that something that we come together to do? And part of why we come to work is to uncover new insights and, and strategies so that we can continue to evolve. Um, and, and so that's that's and sometimes when we set the stage, like, for example, when we identify our core values or key behaviors, we might we might do an initiative right to educate people on it and then we tend to make the mistake of kind of thinking that then everybody understood it and they're going to remember it and they're going to be thinking about it yeah. every day and leaders are are nine times more likely to be perceived as under communicative than over communicative so so we need to be um evoking these new ways of thinking and the mental models a lot more frequently than we think we are and we can do that by reminding people simply but it can be by pointing out when these behaviors happen and celebrating them and say this is what it looks like to take a smart risk even though it didn't work out you know we we talked we thought about the mistake and we learned from it and and this is going to be a really valuable lesson for us to make kind of smarter risks going forward um uh, and when it doesn't happen, then having those conversations, especially if it's something that I, as a leader, you know, went and, and did a shortfall in, just acknowledging that and talking about my reflections on it and what I'm going to change going forward uh, openly and, and explicitly. So that's framing, that is using language to help people change the way they think. Um, second is creating like systems and habits to engage both in the learning zone and the performance zone. And we've talked about some of those, but when and how are we going to engage in the learning zone and the performance zone? How do we make that the default way that we work? And then the third part, which is really important and often missing, is visibly and explicitly modeling learning. Uh, when people become leaders, they often feel like they need to know and be sure of the right answers. They, and they need to kind of act like knowers, yeah. not like learners. Uh, and, and often they engage in learning in private, right? When people aren't watching, they might have um, a coach that they have conversations with or do a lot of reading or listening to podcasts, but other people experience them as knowers. And when we talk about the importance of learning, but act like a knower, our behavior will act, will speak louder than our words and people will emulate the knowing behaviors rather than the learning behaviors. So we need to show that we're learners, talk about what we want to improve, ask for other people's feedback, talk about our mistakes and what we're, what we're learning from them. And sometimes we, we fear that if we do that, other people will lose confidence in us and in the organization. Uh, they'll feel like we are incompetent or we're not going to get to success because we don't know what we're doing. But the reality is that these behaviors are what makes us stronger. They are what 
what enable us to navigate change and learn from change and, and drive change and create change. And so if we come to understand that ourselves and communicate that to others, then other people can feel more confident, right, in the world that we live in that is complex and fast changing and know what behaviors to engage in confidently in order for us to get to success. I think this is such an important uh, conversation to have. And I, it strikes me also that sometimes I think if we think about how we develop talent, in organizations, our talent development programs are also perhaps a little bit misguided. You know, we talk about high potential talent. We, we, we kind of cherry pick the people that we should be developing. They get a lot of attention and in fact have the permission to be in the learning zone very visually. Um, there's also, of course, an expectation that comes along with it in terms of what they, what they do. But, and, and even just the way that we measure performance. You know, we, we don't necessarily measure learning. We measure concrete performance with very specific KPIs, key performance indicators. Do we have to change the way we hire, we staff, we train, we measure people in our organizations? Those are great things to think about. And they are part of these, um, this work to think about which systems and structures in an organization send the message that abilities are fixed. Like for example, if we think about high potential programs as a person is either high potential or not, and that's fixed, it's not like, so one, one question is, um, do you communicate that anybody can, can qualify for these programs if they do certain things and become, you know, and, and meet the criteria rather than, you know, you're, you're assessed at one point and then you're either, you know, identified as somebody who has the high ability fixed or not. Uh, so Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, uh, one of the messages he sends is that potential is nurtured, not predetermined, right? So that tells you like potential is something that we don't know. Like if we look at somebody else, we don't know what their potential is until we've gone through the process and we, we work to develop. And there's a lot of people that were thought of to not be special and have any special talent who became like the best in the world at what they do. And so we can't really look at somebody and know kind of what their potential is. Um, and so this language that we use can create a fixed mindset and, and the structures, like you're saying, like if we only create learning zone structures for a subset of employees and not others, that's going to limit our, you know, our growth as an organization quite a lot. Uh, you talked about how we hire people. We can think about assessing for two types of competence. There's the domain competence of the technical skills and what's needed to execute and perform the job. And there's the learning competence and dispositions of how much does this person want to grow and how much do they solicit feedback? Do they understand that mistakes are really important? Um, and we can assess people on both of these dimensions. And we, we do want people who can ideally can like hit the ground running on their technical skills and the skills that they need to execute and perform their job. But if, if they're in a fixed mindset, they react defensively to feedback, they're not interested in, in, in improving their skills, that's going to significantly limit them and then you know be negative to our culture. So we wanna be assessing for these two dimensions and then nurturing these two dimensions when we onboard people and kind of what's our employer brand? Are we, are we communicating that, that growth is is important to us so that people self-select into um into wanting to be in this culture people who are interested in growth or in receiving feedback and people who are scared of feedback maybe choose not to work for us because they're scared of it um so these are all things to think about yes as we as we continue to to build a coherent harmonious system and culture that supports growth so there's the deliberate action at the part of the whole company, the, you know, as we think about our strategies and plans forward, we need to really make an assessment on the practice side. What, what are our practices saying? Are our practices matching our vision? If we want to be that learning organization that's innovative, what inside of our system is maybe working against that? And what do we have to change? It's very Absolutely. helpful. Um, we mentioned Microsoft a couple of times here. Are there other companies that you would say, oh my gosh, they are like a great example of a learning organization 
where the balance seems to be really, um, really alive every day. Absolutely. There's a lot of them that I, I talk about in the book. Uh, some of my, you know, some examples. Um, there's a company called Scratch Labs, which creates uh, foods for athletes. So, for example, uh, foods that they can have in their pockets that don't melt, but that have a lot of energy uh, for 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 athletes that 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 perform at high levels. Um, and so they do many things that I discuss in the book, but one of the things that I love that they do is how they frame things. So their CEO, uh, Ian McGregor, one of the ways that he guides the organization is to talk about innovation as being on a spectrum from on one end, there's seed and nurture, and the other one is launch and learn. So in seed and nurture, you do a lot of research with focus groups or like with testing on the lab. Uh, to get really smart before you put things in front of customers. And with launch and learn is like you do a little bit of research and, and, and testing, but you pretty quickly just put something out there to see how it works in front of customers. Yep. And, and these two different approaches, and it's a spectrum, uh, can work well or less well for, for companies in different situations with different ways to go to market. And so for them, you know, in particular, they want people to be in the launch and learn uh, category because they can move quickly. They don't have kind of distribution channels. They could, they sell directly to their customers so they can quickly iterate when things don't work or they can kind of create new flavors of foods, for example, when things do work. And so that's, that's one way. And so, um, another way that he frames is he talks about scratch labs being like a boat and the team being like the crew. And sometimes when you're in a boat, you, you, if you have a, a mistake, you, you have a problem on deck above water, you have a fire, for example, it's really easy to see the fire. There's people there that you can quickly turn it off, like just pour water over it and fix the problem. Uh, but when you are underwater, there might not be few people there. You might be in the engine room. And if, if you create a hole in the boat, it might sink. And so he encourages people to think about when you're taking risks, are you above the waterline or below the waterline? If you're below the waterline, meaning you can create a lot of damage, then engage your colleagues in thinking this through before you, you take the risk. If you're above the waterline, just like take the risk, just move quickly and learn quickly. Um, and and that, those are t examples of framing that help their people know how to behave. So to support that as a system, uh, once a quarter, they have a full company meeting and they talk about one or two examples where they experienced either great success or great failure. And they, they, they examine that together, going back to the decision points, the, the critical decision points, the information that people had at that point. And they think about how did the team behave here? What decision did they make? And was that consistent with how we want to behave? And sometimes they made a decision that failed, uh, but the team, the team behaved in the way that they do want to behave. And so they say, yes, this is, this is an example of how we want to behave. That we, you know, they took a smart risk, it failed, we learned from it. Um, so those are examples of like scratch labs. Uh, another company that I love is called Clear Choice Dental Implants, and they have fantastic learning zone strategies and systems. And so, for example, they have um, a kind of learning progressions that people, resources that people can use to build their skills. But when you're kind of in the middle of a progression, one of the things they do is you, you can't take kind of the next module until you help somebody who's more of a novice in that progression. Maybe you, that. you serve them and you give them feedback and it, it, it encourages people to, to learn with each other, right? Yeah. Um, they also have created games where, for example, the, the people who interact with patients, uh, they have cards that have a customer situation in one side of the card. It might be something the customer said or something the customer did. And so the person reads that situation, and the people around the table talk about what they would do in that situation. And they have a conversation, right? It's a simulation about how, how, what are different ways to behave in this situation. Um, and, and that's a super fantastic way to learn with each other and to think about how to handle something and to prepare. Um, or they videotape, you talked about video earlier, they videotape their interactions with patients when they have patient consent. And they have those videos available to 
to examine and to think about how they, for example, how they address an objection and they can share that part of the video with somebody else to get their ideas. So these are very deliberate uh, forms of habituating and systematizing the learning zone, which, which have allowed them to, to have an over 50% market share in, in their core mar market. So there is the connection to the bottom line then, you know, I, 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 as we were saying, is that we sometimes in that performance zone because of the bottom line, but it's a short term gain. But the connection to the bottom line for the longer term can be proven through some of these companies that you've been following. Absolutely. I mean, another, we like consistently, the highest performers are those that engage in the learning zone on a regular basis. Another example, and, and it, is, it's, it, is, it is a paradox. We think that we, don't, we have too much to do. We don't have time to engage in the learning zone, but it is the people who engage in the learning zone regularly who get more done and perform higher. So an, another example is um, at New York Life, they have thousands of insurance agents. And one of the things that they do there is they invite these insurance agents to form what they call study groups, which are just completely optional peer groups where people get together, say once a month, and they just support each other. They talk about, hey, here's, here's a challenge I'm having. What ideas do people have? Or what resources have you found to be helpful? And just they support one another in, in learning together. Um, and it turns out that the, there's a very, very clear correlation. The people who choose to engage in these study groups perform significantly higher than those yeah. who, um, who don't. And it's like the, the lowest performer agents, about 7% engage in these study groups. And of the highest performing agents, uh, about 65% of them engage in these study groups. And you can see in all the different layers, there's just a, a gradual, gradual change. And I've worked with them a lot. I've, I've talked to a lot of, of their highest performing agents. And I know that the ones that don't engage in study groups, they have other learning zone strategies. They might read a lot or they might have groups outside of New York Life. Um, but, but when we habituate the learning zone, it, it makes us more competent and able to achieve higher results. Yeah, which is also very important though, what you, you said, they optional. And I think this is an important part of, of learning is that learning does need to be something I sign up for because I believe it needs to go back to my belief system. It needs to go back to some purpose for my, that I also individually consider to be important. Now, on the other hand, having said that, we do have mandatory trainings, right? So if, so in particular, if you're in the, in the medical, um, medical innovation field, um, we have to have those because of the regulations. So everybody has to be trained on design control, which is really about good development practice, but the design control regulation was put in place by FDA some you know, years and years ago, partly because those good development practices weren't seen consistently, and that poses a safety risk potentially with medical products. So now we have to mandate that kind of training. Um, I am one of these providers of those kinds of services, making sure that we put those quality systems in place and that there's training available. And I have found that actually what's really important is to still instill so we know that there's a mandatory requirement, but then there's also a practice piece that is can be built on top of that. And that can be that can really go after the purpose from the larger. So the so the big thing I hear, common theme coming in all of these organizations, there is a larger purpose. There is a there's there's something that people can relate to uh, from an organizational level perspective and then translate that to their own own position and how they contribute. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I agree yeah, with everything you said is when in learning, you know, we can't shove learning into somebody else. Yeah. Somebody has to be interested in learning. And so in those mandatory uh, programs, there's probably, like you said, a good reason for this is really important information for anybody doing this job to have. And then we can probably kind of think about are we communicating the importance of that and the why of the program, right? Yeah. So that people uh, lean into it and choose it, even though it's mandatory, they say, oh, I, I am, this is important for me to know, it's gonna help patients or it's gonna help me do my job better. 
um, and it's going to be valuable use of my time. And so we can also kind of think about that. So how yeah. do you position that exactly? And it's a stepping stone for something that might be extremely important for them, just like our basic education. Uh, so so I, I really like that. So we need to also think about how do we communicate things and how do we, uh, how do we message things across the board? It shouldn't be about compliance. It should still be about quality and the outcomes to the patient um, that we really want to affect. And that is, that's really what inspires most people in this field. So we are getting to the end of our time here. And uh, I could speak with you for a very long time based on this book. Um, I want to point out one of my favorite things because I'm a very visual person. Um, you have actually a picture of which I, I won't be able to show maybe through the camera here, but there's a propeller in, in here in the book. And it's a great way to actually remember the critical learnings that this book represents. Can you very quickly just say what's on the propeller? Sure. Yeah. So the growth propeller is the five components that enable us to be a great learner and performer. And so picture a propeller with three blades and in the center, in the axis, there are two things. There's our identity and our purpose. Um, and in the blades, each blade is the beliefs, habits, and community. And so we, we each need to build these things to make them coherent and harmonious so they work for us and, and, and so that things are in harmony. Um, and so for our identity, I think the key is to see ourselves as a learner, as someone who is always continuing to learn and grow, and we're doing that proactively. Um, our purpose, we've talked about purpose and what's our why. Uh, that gives us the energy to engage in both the learning zone and the performance zone. There's some key beliefs that I talk about. What we've talked about one being growth mindset and fixed mindset. The belief that people can change is an example of something that helps us be more effective. When it comes to habits, there's often we 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 engage in learning reactively. When there's a mistake, then we use it as an opportunity to learn. That's important. But but what I encourage people to think about is: Are you proactively driving your own change and your own growth? Um, and then finally, there's our community, right? The people who are around us. Do we feel like we belong in that community? And do we see everybody there as a learner, as someone who's continuing to, to improve and grow and solicit feedback, share mistakes with each other so we can learn together? And when, when these five things are strong in a way that supports learning, then we can both kind of grow and perform better. That's a, that's a great summary of all these different things that we have spoken about. Before we end today, a kind of more, more personal question for you. The last chapter of this book, which we didn't get to, is about going global. And it touches on the big things in the world. And we've talked a lot about change. Sometimes we look at the world and we say it's overwhelming to think what well, we have to change. Um, and it's hard to, to actually get people, people together to make change happen. Are you going global yourself uh, in your next agenda, in your next mission? What is that? What do you want to affect, partly with this book? And what is your own learning agenda today? Well, yes. So in that last chapter, I, uh, I, there are lots of big challenges in the world. And to, to tackle those challenges and overcome them, we can't just be in the performance zone. We have to engage in the learning zone. And often we do just get stuck in performance. Like, for example, we have this political camps, right? Where we identify, with, we put a label on ourselves. Here's the camp that I'm in. And that prevents us from hearing and listening to people with different perspectives so we can learn from them, their different experiences and perspectives. Um, and then we, we have a, like a, a solution for something. And what, what we try to do is try to gain power. And once we get power, then we focus on execution rather than experimentation to get smarter. Um, and so what gets done is just determined by who's in power, not by a process of continuous learning uh, so that we can figure out, you know, what, what works better and, and try new things and things that we don't already know. Um, so, so we can collaborate better with people who think like us and people who think unlike us uh, in order to, to develop new insights. And personally, for you talked about kind of my missions, I, I think of my missions as th three missions. One is to 
generate and ra radiate love, joy, and kindness. That's just the way that I try to live to experience life better and to radiate those emotions to the people around me. Uh, second is to inspire a world of learners. And this is the work that we've been talking about with the performance paradox. Um, and then third, and I think it, it, this one relates to what you're talking about, um, is, is to kind of inspire radical imagination. And by that, I mean that our innovation or problem solving, we can think process, we can think of it in two ways. One is, uh, or at least in two ways, but this is a framework. One is like a present forward process where we're looking at how things are and trying to make them better. And most of the world and most of our work tends to be like that. We are trying to make the present better. But a different approach that I'm personally interested in and spending some time on is future back, where we forget the present and we try to imagine the future in the, in the long term, like 100, 200, 300 years from now, what could the world be like? Because 300 years ago, our, the way we thought about our relationships in many ways are very different. So how, how could we organize human life in 300 years, forgetting how it's organized right now? And that, that, that process uh, can lead to different solutions than if we think, if we start with what reality is today. Um, and then those, some of those solutions can be applicable to solving problems in the present. So that's an example of uh, a learning zone strategy to try to go into the unknown, right? To try to come up with new ideas that then we could test and also new visions so that when there are points of instability and transformation, we can, we can tap on more ideas on what, what we could work toward. Um, so my learning zone you asked about, uh, I am working on like, that's something that I'm really interested in, but in the kind of present forward world, I'm personally, you know, just working on uh, being slower to saying yes. There's just a lot of opportunities that I'm, I get excited about because I want to help and I want to be engaged in exciting projects. And just, I, 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 I want to have a higher filter um, because right now I'm just overextended. So that's something that's hard for me and something that I'm working on, on being slower to say yes. And I suspect that you will be quite busy um, as people be reading this book. The book again is called The Performance Paradox. If someone wants to have this book on their bookshelf and right next to them every day, um, where can they get it? They can get it anywhere books are sold, Amazon or anywhere else. Um, uh, the book is, is available wherever books are sold and they can also find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty... Um, active there and i have a monthly newsletter at, at my website brisenio.com okay so it will be possible for folks to also engage directly with you through through those resources eduardo thank you very much this was a wonderful conversation and um i can't wait for some of the follow-up um, based on what you said you are currently interested in your own learning so so thank you very much Thank you for having me here, Tarja, and for all you do. It's a pleasure to connect with you and speak with you. Likewise. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Check out leadersagenda.com for information on our past and future episodes. And I do hope that you engage with us also on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook, and post your comments about what you heard today and your ideas forward. Kitas. Thank you.